Welcome back, friends and scoundrels, to Horror in the Hills. I am Bran. And I'm Lynn. And this is Movie Book. Because I changed it. Because it's not really a versus thing. It's You always do. It's a thing. Not always. It's an ongoing process. <laughs> it's a living organism. It is a living orga- organism. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Do the Twitter. Look at the Twitter. I don't post at the Twitter necessarily <laughs> unless it's to communicate or to share the video side. I got to figure out what I'm going to do with the podcast side. Look at it. I don't post there, but look at it. <laughs> I post there, but it's only communications for people. I'm not necessarily looking for conversation there because it's a dumpster fire and it's a nice, easy way to communicate. Anyways, what did we, what did we do this time? Oh, I suppose we should set it up a little bit. I suppose. So, movie book is where I, Bran, watch a movie version of a book that Lynn reads. And then we try to have a conversation about it. Not really a comparison necessarily, even though it sounds like it is a lot of times. But, yeah. So we just try to see if there's enough similarity between the two that two people could converse about it and it kind of pushes conversations between us sometimes anyways i guess the reason this came about is he likes horror movies but i refuse to watch them and he always wants to talk about them so i'm trying to read the book versions i love horror movies it's almost all i watch most of the time it's either youtube or horror movies (laughs) so what did we do today uh the island of dr moreau by hg wells This is our second H.G. Wells, the first one being The Invisible Man. And watching videos about movies about H.G. Wells books, he seems to cover a lot of similar things a lot of times. But we'll get to that over time. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. We'll, we'll figure it out. Is your synopsis first? Sure. Adrift in a dinghy, Edward Prendick, the single survivor from... The good ship Lady Vane is rescued by a vessel carrying a profoundly unusual cargo, a menagerie of savage animals. Nursed to recovery by their keeper Montgomery, who gives him dark medicine that tastes of blood, Prendick soon finds himself stranded upon an uncharted island in the Pacific with his rescuer and the beasts. Here he meets Montgomery's master, the sinister Dr. Moreau a brilliant scientist whose notorious experiments in vivisection have caused him to abandon the civilized world. It soon becomes clear he has been developing these experiments with truly horrific results. Horror? <laughs> Idiot. Yes. Um, I'm a little liquor in my system tonight, so this might be interesting and fun. Fabulous. <laughs> so, um... Seeing as there are multiple versions, adaptations of this, I only knew of two when I made my choice. So You chose the wrong one. I went with the 1977 version. I don't know if I'd have necessarily chosen Lost Souls anyways. I don't know. It had the highest rating, which is what I your know. system is. I know. I might have to modify that as well going forward and do... Maybe the more accessible, although that one's a little bit more difficult to tell than rating. So we'll do rating. I'll just have to do better research in the future. Anyways, I did the 1977 version, and I'm going to do off of IMDb because apparently it's really hard to find anything. Metacritic didn't have any of these movies on it, and Fandango just has them, but it doesn't do anything with them. So I went with IMDb. A shipwrecked survivor discovers a remote island owned by a crazed scientist who is carrying out sinister experiments on the island's inhabitants. That's the one I'm going to read. Because it's IMDb and you can put up whatever you want. (laughs) It's like the Wikipedia for movies, but worse. And that's saying something. Um, Do you have anywhere you want to start or do we just want to get right into the questions? Let's just get right into it. Because like I told you, my notes are just... You have notes this time. Crap, I would have written in the margins if I had owned the book. But you have notes this time. Will you stop pushing me? No. (laughs) So yeah, this is how this goes. We have a series of questions to kind of help guide this to see 
if it's okay and a lot of times we go off on tangents and digressions and what the fuck is that over there so uh how did it make you feel uh well once it got into it because it was a little slow a lot of slow getting into but once it got into it it's thrilling i suppose it's got a much faster pace to it and it's also a thinker yeah were there any elements of horror to it that it made you feel besides thrilling uh the what if question is horrifying yeah yeah because it, it it does seem like that's hg wells's big thing is not direct in your face contextual horror it's subtextual make you think about the horrors of humanity really yes that is that is horrifying to think about so that is horrifying and he definitely does want you to think about things was yours i can't really say that it made me feel anything i see what he was going for but it's just i'm so thoughtful about this stuff anyways and horror doesn't really bother me 90 percent of the time and it's odd that some of the gore stuff is what gets me but it's not just gore specifically it's it's or in general it's very specific types of and not even necessarily the gore aspect of it it's how it happens it's the uncontrolled self-harm usually yeah or just really real visceral like in green room oh my god (laughs) i'm not gonna watch it no matter how many times you mention it but it's got Pat Stew and Anton Yelchin. I'm sorry, Sir Pat Stew. <laughs> so, I mean, it. as far as horror goes, I didn't really go anywhere with it. Which is why, you know, when we first read and watched it, we had a minor debate over whether or not it was horror. But at that point also, when I brought it up, I was still Lost adrift in the, in the ocean. <laughs> yes. And I wasn't seeing how being adrift in the ocean. Which is not a problem with, I don't know about Island of Lost Souls, but uh, both direct titled iterations, it is not as much of a problem. Um, This one in particular, I'm going to try to not reference the 96 version too much, even though I think it did a little bit better job in a lot of ways. Maybe maybe you can watch these. They're not too bad. I don't want to. Whatever. Whatever. It just sucks talking by myself. I'm sorry. I'm talking to you right now. About a book. <laughs> you watched the movie. Um, oh my god. Anyways. I didn't realize I was going to be fighting with a drunk today. <laughs> <laughs> the 77 version, he's in a dinghy with two other guys and one of them, like it picks up one of them like dies as the very opening scene and they push him over the side him and the other guy and then he finds the island (laughs) it is it is definitely very definitely not the setup for this one i mean yes there's a dinghy so since we're in feelings do you want to explore that a little bit or would that be better in explore what feelings uh or would that be better in the themes and stuff something i thought the isolationism (laughs) this <laughs> I do think isolation is a, a big theme so okay all right we're off to a running start were the portrayals of the characters realistic to the setting based on their qualities and choices yeah I think so I mean I think Moreau's exactly what he would be when you have a prideful man like that driven only by his ambition and science isolated on an island he's exactly what he would be and then the same goes for montgomery you know essentially banished from society and a drunk to boot is he what is he in the book a man oh like what's his profession prior to uh a biologist i don't know it was during the boat part and i kept Waiting for the boat part to be over. No, Montgomery is a doctor. Prendrick did biology. So, 
And the 77 version doesn't go too extravagant with anything. For the setting of the movie, everything works okay. I mean, Moreau's been there, he, I think he says 17 years, even in this even in this version of the movie. And he's kind of just the mad scientist guy who's there. I mean, he's not really mad, mad scientist. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, wouldn't say he's very fantastical or anything, but he's not. There, There is an element of the movie that is slow paced, but it's the revelation of everything, not being on a boat for a third of it. And then you're on the island and now everything needs to go. Braddock, as he's called in the movie, Andrew Braddock, um, it's an engineer on a boat so like works on the engine kind of guy yeah and so i mean he's just your kind of early 1900s late 1800s engine guy just blue collar kind of person hmm. finds himself in the place that's interesting because frederick uh he is essentially your gentleman he doesn't work for a living, and that's a big part of it, is the fact that he doesn't really do anything. He got stranded because he was going somewhere just He just happened because to be he on the bored. boat. And... He was bored, so he was going somewhere. Hmm. He's kind of just... He's, he's a gentleman. He's a man of leisure. He does what he can because he can, and he doesn't have to actually work for a living. He's got fuck you money. Essentially. <laughs> but it leads to a lot of... How he reacts to things is the fact that he doesn't work and he can't really do anything. Like when it comes to when he gets off the island, he can't build a raft because he's never had to do anything. Yeah. Hmm. I think it contributes a lot to his character when he's dealing with the beast people too because he, Go ahead. he kind of reacts in a way as someone who just, because he just goes along with things and does whatever, he just goes along and keeps doing whatever because he doesn't really have the upbringing of a man who actually has to make choices and do things for reasons other than simply because he wants to um it's kind of where my detachment from the horror comes from in this one too is like uh, me and god i hate doing this sometimes it feels like such cop out sometimes but a 1970s movie so the acting of the time plays a big role into it, but it feels like Braddock doesn't really, isn't really that affected by it. He's like, oh yeah, they're just animal kind of people. I mean, it does affect him, but it's not, it, it kind of like now, sometimes how people, like you see something that um, might affect you or you interact with somebody but you don't actually react to it. You just kind of bottle it for a moment and then, and just deal with the situation. He kind of has like moments, roller coaster moments, because when he first sees them, they're definitely monsters and he's definitely re reacting to them. But then after Moreau explains what they are and he stops and actually looks at them, he starts to see more of their humanity in them and less of the beast. And he attributes it to maybe because Moreau, he's only got Moreau and Montgomery to compare to, and they're both eccentric people, that he's, the isolation of it with just them and the beast people, they become more normal because he forgets what actual people are like. Um, see here, Montgomery. Eh, Montgomery fits pretty well. I mean, he's not exactly eccentric or anything, but he just kind of, he's a mercenary in the movie, so he just does the job because he's being paid to hmm. which adds an interesting element to him especially when you get later on and we'll talk about that in the themes thing a little bit more maybe uh are there specific animal people in the book that matter a whole <laughs> lot heckin there are a few that do ape man the puma woman the hyena man. Hyena woman. Maling. Maling. Yes, there are a few. The Sayer. Is he called the Sayer in the book? Yeah. Because, I mean, the Sayer law is pretty important as far as 
Vago, and he, again, going into the greater themes of everything, plays an important role, or plays an interesting role between, as kind of a liaison between the ruling class and the underclass. And then Maling, uh, he's there. He's not named in the movie, I don't think. I don't recall hearing it in the couple times I watched it. And he's, um, where does he fit in in the book? Uh, he's the only one of the Beast people who really stays around the men and who isn't in the forest. He is the servant of Montgomery mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Montgomery, he kind of feels bad for them. Because Moreau tosses them out and he's done with them. And Montgomery is still the one who goes and visits them and makes sure they're okay. And he relates most to Mling and he's his servant and he goes with him on the boat. And he's his most important thing, I think, is um, when... Because Montgomery also brought rabbits back to the island and he taught Mling how to cut it up and cook it, and it was, um, Ling's tasting of blood when he licked his fingers, and it was the, one of the things that kicked off the thing, but Ling was the only one who kept, um, sides with Montgomery. He didn't turn against them like the other beasts did. I think it's because he oh. was the one who was treated most human. He's just a straight-up servant in this movie. Uh, he just kind of there um i think his biggest role is he does help uh, he helps somebody get out but i don't remember exactly who or what because it's kind of inconsequential yeah it's pretty inconsequential because he saves montgomery at least once that i can remember and um they end up dying together so as far as the question goes i think everybody's pretty Realistic to everything. Yes. Um, all things considered. All things considered. So, is would you consider the setting to be a characteristic of the story? Or a character. Characteristic. Whatever. Uh, Dr. Moreau seems to think so. He's, he feels that the island was waiting for him. I don't think the island itself necessarily, just the isolation is a key part. For mine, definitely, it's more the aspect of the isolation. It's it, it could definitely take place anywhere. And the other thing is if where there could be horrific moments or more uh, uh, a stronger em um, emphasis on the horror, the jungle could play a bigger role in that. But overall... I realistically no i don't think so no and i don't if moreau could get away with doing it in africa anywhere or china or it, whatever it's the isolation that's key not the island itself yeah yeah the island doesn't really provide anything unlike hill house or uh dairy indiana or in or dairy maine yeah. <laughs> Whatever. One of those wow. things. Wow. He writes everything to take place in Maine. I don't know why I got that wrong. <laughs> um, that was quick. <laughs> How'd you find the pacing? Uh, slow to start, and then pretty consistent after that. Pretty well paced right up till the end. I said mine. The movie gets right into it. Both versions. So. And it doesn't take time dawdling or dwelling on things, mostly, that don't have a whole lot to do with the story. Like, each event leads to something later on. Well, that happens once they get to the island. There's not too much dawdle. I wish this would have spent less time stranded at sea. But... Yeah, it'd be a little bit different if it actually did something with it, but... I'm guessing. I haven't read it. Well, it's just, he's picked up by Montgomery, and there's weird animals, and weird servants, and the captain's a dick. 
he gets stranded again <laughs> because the captain throws him off the boat and Montgomery wasn't going to take him to the island. Yeah. It just, I would rather have spent more time on the island. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't terribly boring or anything. It just, overall, it was just a 70s movie. <laughs> Um, philosophy or messaging behind the story, themes, metaphors, symbology, blah blah blah. <laughs> Many. This is where I have notes. <laughs> this is where I have notes. Oh no, oh, that's the wrong note paper. That's is it horror? <laughs> <laughs> do you even have the right notes? I do. Do you like to start? Yeah, I think the Me? biggest, most consistent theme is. The question of morality. First off, what Dr. Moreau is doing in general. But then, um, of laws. And that plays out a lot throughout the movie. Let's see. I'm trying to put my thoughts where I want them. So, um, with Braddock, in the beginning, um, Moreau is talking about, what's her name, Maria? I closed it. Who? Uh, the female. Mm. Is there a female in the book? There's not a female in the book. Oh, wow. Uh, yes, Maria. Because he says he brought her there. He saved her from a terrible life. Because, uh, doesn't really say how old she was. Uh, I think it was some South American country he picked her up from. I don't remember offhand. But that at age 11, any man be able to buy her and do whatever he wanted to with her. And Braddock said, and Moreau presses him about it, like how he feels about it. And Braddock says, I'm no moralist. And it sets up an interesting character growth and theme for Braddock that he does end up having to kind of moralize by the end a little bit. And Montgomery, uh, being a mercenary, said he just does it because uh, Moreau is paying him. But then Moreau starts testing on Braddock against his consent because Braddock's trying to get off the island. Wow. <laughs> At that point, I just literally completed Montgomery. <laughs> Montgomery goes, well, this is a bridge to, or a bridge too far, however that saying goes, and turns on Moreau. And tries to get his keys, and then Moreau shoots him. Yeah. Apparently, these things change drastically. Interesting. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, it, it changes the tone and themes. Well, that's like what I said. The biggest theme in the movie is morality. Because um, I guess you could say Braddock is just a general morality or amoral not not in the negative um not amoral but he's just or apolitical yeah. or whatever doesn't really put any thought or care into morals he just which goes into the morality of laws i i think it's more a matter of his morality is based on the laws rather than what's actually correct or, or harmful well, cause yeah, there's there's the morality too, because like he d gets upset when he starts operating on the puma, and it still sounds like a puma, and he leaves, and that's where he comes across some of the other beast people in the woods, cause he's trying to get away from the compound where he's being operated on, but it doesn't really become a problem um. until a uh, puma woman starts to sound like a human. And it's that question of where is... Where's the line? And that's, of course, when Prendrick gets upset because he thinks he's going to be next to be vis vivisected because he thinks he's done with the puma and moved on to a human somewhere. And that's what's going to happen to him. Because Moreau doesn't do anything to people because that's not what he's doing. He's trying to create the ideal person. Mm -hmm. Ideal isn't the right word. Uh, rational is what he used. The rational man. The fact that they become human-shaped is just almost coincidence. He said there's a certain art about it, but mm -hmm. it could really be anything. Because 
He said he originally started with a sheep, but it was this horrible, it came out this horrible thing because you can't use prey animals because they don't have that drive to be man. You need other predator animals. So he's trying to make a predator animal into a rational man and then using law to rein in that rationality because he couldn't make a prey animal that didn't have that drive that predators and... do because it just became a frightened creature. Yeah, and and it sickened him. My that that it's actually very interesting to me because um my observations of people and animals is and and I'm going to draw some political lines here also, but people who generally tend to lean towards socialism and the collectivism type things like that seem to be very prey animal like they herd and they're not very aggressive they don't have ambition or anything and then the people who generally are capitalists and free market and true liberal as in you know free from state and rule and stuff um tend to align a little bit more with the predator style animal <laughs> to go into a little bit of my own philosophy there <laughs> but it it you can see some of that but this this maria it 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 eliminates this other theme or symbolism i think that was in the book that puma woman cuz there aren't really there aren't women on the island Mm -hmm. And he's creating, because it is a puma that comes in on the boat too, and he's creating Puma Woman. And she's chained up in the wall, and it's she represents their reaction to feminism at the time. And okay. she rips out of the wall, she breaks free, and she chases down and ends, she's the one who kills Moreau. Because mm. she breaks free and he tries to hunt her down. And he shoots her, but she still overpowers him and kills him, and they kill each other. Nice. Because Maria is just... She's there to be a romantic interest for Braddock. And that is all she is. And if this exact movie was made, it would just be almost an X-rated love scene. No, because there's, there's no real falling out with the men until after Moreau is dead. And Montgomery loses his mind. Um, I, we touched on the morality of Lost thing a little bit. A lot of the morality around that in the movie is, it's the law, I say it's the law, ergo you have to follow it. But, uh, as history has shown us, laws are not always moral. <coughs> Slavery! <laughs> <laughs> Was that subtle enough? No. <laughs> but... It, just because something is a law doesn't make it moral. And it's actually a, a ongoing non-debate that I'm having with somebody. I just haven't had the right time to hit him with it. But it... There is... My biggest thing with it is the war on drugs. Right now. Right. That's our current moral crisis. And mostly in America, but... It's still prevalent in a lot of other places in the world, uh, especially westernized countries. Um, but it, it 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 does bring up that question and tackle it a little bit because, you know, it's don't go on four legs, don't kill, don't eat flesh, uh, don't spill blood, and I mean other than not eating flesh, which is just there to keep them from their animal instincts realistically and no, not going on four lakes. Those are the ones I remember. There might be more. But uh, the the rest of them are, are valid. Don't spill blood and don't kill. Don't claw the bark of trees. Don't chase other men. Don't suck up drink. Which those laws are mostly about control and... They're all laws there to rein in the animal instinct because... Um, the thing that's 
Moreau's problem with the Beast people is he sees these as flaws. N no matter what he does, no matter every time he fixes a flaw, there's still a new one, and the animal always comes back out over time. Which goes into probably the next biggest theme, at least in the movie, probably in the book too, is what is it to be human? Um, which, again, comes down to the laws, morality of things. Um, Moral education is just a perversion and artificial modification of instincts. According to Moreau. Which is interesting for a man who's trying to create a rational being. It's because he's, he's seeking perfection is what he's trying to do. And it's a matter of pride. Yeah. Because that's almost what makes Moreau scarier than like a mad scientist. Because he's not mad. He's a rational man. He is trying to create. And it's his his pride and his ego that's driving him. And that's it's scarier than madness. Yeah. When you've got a rational being well, who is aware of what he's doing and is doing it anyway. Uh, I, no, I'll stick with it. Um, all the worst people throughout human history. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Lenin, Genghis Khan. But yeah, it's, it's these people know what they're doing a lot of times. That's how they're so successful at getting where they are. Either that or they're just born into position. Yeah, no, those are the scariest people. The people who are 100% aware of what they're doing and do it anyways because they have the power and capability to. And there's nothing you can do about it. And Which goes into the ruling class theme. I, I, I think the but, the man is beast is, I think, one of the bigger themes throughout it. Um, because Moreau says, uh, the study of nature makes man at last as remorseless as nature. Because we start to see that nature has no remorse, so we start to not have remorse toward it and what we do to it. Because we used to revere nature, hmm. but we don't anymore. Because we understand it, and we've become... But do we? I mean, at this time. Yes. Writing, and even now, today, I mean, God, I hate that we're living through this because it just seems so generic talking about it a year later or a year into it. But with COVID, I mean, that's a very, for all intents and purposes, that's a very natural thing. And the arrogance, the disgusting arrogance of humans that we can control something like that. And well, see, that this is what it is how about much Moreau. Harm his his has arrogance come from that. that he thinks he can control it, but he can't. Well, and time and, and time again, that's it's was, proven to him, but he keeps trying anyway. That's why I was questioning his rationality, because irrationality is actually the default. And uh, what was his quote again? Which one? About morality. Moral education is just a perversion and artificial modification of instincts. I mean, if you're going with that route, it begs the question of what is morality. Because uh, the example he gives is um, suppress sexuality into religious emotion. Pugnacity is turned into courageous self-sacrifice. These same things. But see, are just... that goes into the exact thing that he's doing there. It's it's, it's essentially hypnotism. I. Like, that goes into exactly what Moreau is attempting to do with animal people. He's teaching the morality based on what he thinks morality is, rather than the more natural aspect of morality, which is very, very basic. You don't hurt people and you don't take their shit. Or cause no harm to others, unless in self-defense. I think at least part of it is just to try and control the animals to wash his hands of them, because once he... Because when he first makes them, he's he thinks he's he's got that, I think I've done it, this is it. And then the more he looks at it, the more flaws he finds. It's like he's looking for them. And he turns it well, out. Which I'm sure he is. Because if you're trying to achieve perfection, you're going to not look for the good, you're going to look for the bad. But on the, the point of the, the man is beast, I think that... Uh, 
thought comes full circle when Prendrick is back in society. And even though he's back around people, he isolates himself anyway. Because after spending so much time with the Beast people, after Montgomery and Moreau, and he's spending time actually with them trying to survive, and he sees them and their descent back to animals, and he's back with people, he can't tell them from the Beast people because he sees so much of the Beast behavior in actual humans Which that he isolates himself away from them because... Goes into more of my own personal philosophy that... I think part of the reason why we're so unsuccessful about controlling those aspects of ourselves as humans is that we're not willing to acknowledge ourselves as animals and how much we are driven by our animal instincts to hunt, to reproduce, well, to eat, to reproduce, and the other things that come from those. Because, <laughs> um... Like our violence, even though I made the comparison of some people to prey animals, overall, humans are predators, and we that's where our violent nature comes from. And we don't actually express that in the way that we are naturally intended to, and we have to find other ways to do it. If you look at resource, uh, if you look at wars, they're mostly about resources and territory, which is generally what skirmishes between animal groups in the wild are about: is resources and territory. Just to give a nice generalized blanket over all of my deeper thoughts, <laughs> which is something I hope, I really do hope to explore doing this a little bit more. I touched on it a little bit, the ruling class. So, especially in the movie, um, when Braddock first really interacts with the animal people, he, uh, I th think he gets chased into their cave. I know, he ends up in their cave somehow. And then uh, Moreau shows up and shoots his pistol. And he's like, this is a man. He's one of mine. He's the keeper of the law, and thus Braddock becomes the hand that hurts and the hand that heals. He is the hand. So Moreau is essentially trying to make him a police officer for all intents and purposes. And, like, that that's what his role is supposed to be. So that's, And I actually pulled the uh, ruling class thing after watching the second movie, but it's still a, a theme present. Um, rules for thee but not for me which is usually how the ruling class works and even today but all throughout history well that one it doesn't become a thing right away because Moreau and Montgomery and Prendrick aren't called man I mean well, Moreau it, that, that was me uh, paraphrasing it I don't remember exactly what he says, but Moreau is considered master and... Yes, he Moreau is the hand of pain and, and healing. That's Moreau. And then Montgomery is the other one in, with the whip. But when Prendrick runs into their cave, he's running from Moreau when he thinks that Moreau is going to vivisect him. And... He stumbles onto Ape Man, who says, oh, you're a five, too, and holds up his hand, because they both have five fingers, because that's how they separate the beast people, is I'm a five or a three, based on how many weird clawy fingers Digits. they have. Yes. So he says, yes, so Ape Man assumes that Prendrick is another one of the beast people, and he says, you're new, because Prendrick says, where's their food, and I'm lost. So he assumes he's the new beast person, and he takes him to the Sayer of Laws, and Prendrick sways and says all the laws in their churchy manner with them. Because religion is another big one, but not the point right now. Uh, and then Moreau and Montgomery come and find and chase him, and eventually they're standing out in the ocean screaming at each other, and this is when Moreau says they're just animals, they're not people, I don't do that with people, and he comes back, and that's when Moreau explains, 
but it's the fact that the Beast people think that Prendrick is one of them, and then later he's with Montgomery, and he has a whip, too, and he has a gun, too, and Eight Man sees him, and it begins to question, I thought, he was a man, and now he's one of the ones with whips. If we're man and he's a five, like me, can't we do that, too? And that's when he begins to question this hierarchy, I guess. It, it, it's a class structure. Yeah, he begins to question it. it goes it. beyond being just a normal hierarchy. It's a clear division between um, yes, those up here and those down here. And that's when Ape Man begins to question, and, he, and then the Sayer of Laws questions it, too. And then it ultimately breaks when um, Montgomery and Prendrick find a dead rabbit, which means someone broke the law, and Cheetah Man, I think, did it. And Moreau says that they have to find Cheetah Man so they can punish him because no one can escape the law. And even though the law says you're not allowed to chase other men, he gets all the Beast people to chase down Cheetah Man. So it's... It's okay now, but it wasn't before, and it, 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 those two things just completely break everything down. And that's when you get the question of for thee and me, or whatever it was you said. Rules for thee, but not for me? Yes. The ruling class? Yes. Because I don't think it was something they even questioned until they thought... Prendrick was one of them, and then he was allowed to live with them and have a whip and a gun. Yeah. And then Which, they were allowed to hunt other animals. For the movie actually having more time to explore that, both movies, for that matter, having more time to explore that, it doesn't. Like I say, if you could take these two movies and combine them, because ironically enough, even though the 96 one uh, modernizes it, and still changes a few things pretty considerably. I think it's actually a lot closer to the source material in a lot of ways. Because in the 77 one, there's no rabbits or anything. Yeah. Um, Which is just a weird thing. Um, I don't know, is it explained why the rabbits are there in the book? Or are they just there? Uh, Montgomery specifically brought them back to the island because he was tired of eating vegetables all the time. Okay, makes sense. So it's all Montgomery's fault. Cause, it, it, this is a plot hole thing. Is Montgomery's the whip, and everything before that, right? Yes. And he used he's used it on them before. Yes. But he's separated from them, right? Yes. It, like they already thought of him as separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I suppose it's not that big of a plot hole. Even though you should still like, why are, like if the law is no one does, why are you allowed to? Well, because that's where the religious theme comes in. Well, I'm going to pull it back from religion. You can and, try. And make it more about control specifically. Because that was ultimately the purpose of the church for a long time. And I think it's let it go. But states have filled that gap for them. Because those, those two things for a long time were very intermingled. But... As I said, the state has filled that place for the church, and a lot of people, like um, another recent historical event that people are tired, some people are tired of living through, <laughs> um, with Texas, a lot of people pointing to the fact that they're not on federal regulations and blah blah blah. The state has become a type of religion. So that that's why I'm pulling it back from just religion specifically, and it, it it dogma might be better. You can't because a lot of the symbolisms, the isms, are religion. Uh, given the time period, yes. Because Moreau doesn't kill the creatures, except for one. He created one, but it didn't walk. It slithered on the ground, and it the legless one. The snake was truly evil, and it was the only one he killed. Until Pumbaa Woman. 
Yes. <laughs> but they killed each other. I just, there might be a lot of allegory there, but... But it's it's the symbol that uh, Moreau makes him, then the devil was created by man. But it was... Because <sighs> Moreau is God. He is... makes living things for his own curiosity, like God does. If God is like the God from... Good omens? Yes. Well, I mean, he did. That's why he, you know, arced it and started over. Because he did a bad job of it. But he's he's cruel and indifferent and concerned only with his pride. And gives them laws they can't understand and follow. And abandons them to a life of torment. Like God. (laughs) Well, here's the thing with that, though, is that he just says the laws... Without explaining them. These are very laws, very, these laws are very easy to understand with an explanation. God doesn't explain his laws either. I know, but when you look at those laws compared to these laws. Because they're both infallible. Those themes don't come up in either movie, so. Not that specifically. But if that's Moreau's interaction with the Beast People and... The cruelty of that, it brings up the question of um, man's relationship with God when Prendrick goes back and sees the beast, the people as the same as the beast people. And then there's, there's Ape Man. He gets kind of uh, excited when he talks about the House of Pain. So he's kind of like a religious zealot, the self-flagulators. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think there is more religious themes then there might be in the book um i I don't they're not explored deeply enough i think it focuses more on the question morality and what it is to be a human than it does the religious aspect and in a kind of backhanded way those are all tied together anyways but they are well what about uh because like uh just for a minor reference, the 96 version, um, Moreau does refer to them all as his children. And he probably does rightfully think of them as his children, but he doesn't... If they're his children, not, then... Not in the manner of, you're my offspring, but you're just something that I take care of. Yeah, if they're his children, they're all black sheep. Because he kind of despises them and hates them. Because they're just... Because they're not perfect. Yes. All they are is just the embodiment of everything he's done wrong. All of his failures. Yes. It's a strike to his pride. Um, Now, does it name eugenics specifically in the book, or is that something just from the movie? Movie? Does it call it eugenics by name? Okay. I just... For 1977, that was interesting because you... It doesn't really specifically go there. I don't even think it subtextually goes there. But the racism that became connected to eugenics through like Darwin and then much later on the Nazis. And it was used as a means to perpetuate the idea of white supremacy and that black people were less... So, I mean, like, you could say that that's there very easily, especially with the naming of eugenics. But in the movie itself, it doesn't directly beg that question. When uh, Moreau is talking with Braddock about eugenics, he's um, just talking about the science. And he's got four different embryos, like a dog and a human and, like, an ape or something. And he, they're all very early stages. And he, if you look at these, they're the exact same. Whether or not that science is actually accurate with those is relatively irrelevant for the sake of the movie. Um, they are the same. And I think, I believe, if I'm right, or if maybe that at some point most embryos are relatively the same, most fetuses are relatively the same at some very early point in their development. 
but it's very early on and they go in their own direction very quickly after that. Um, but that's what, that that's kind of where Moreau is going in the movie is trying to figure out like why, if we start off very similar, why do we change so drastically? Where does that change come in? No, he doesn't. But after 1945, after after the Nazi fiasco in Germany, I say that like it's something to just brush off. <laughs> it's a very terrible event in history. Don't get me wrong. I just speaking off the cuff at the moment. Um, the term eugenics was changed to just genetics because of that racist connotation. And, you know, with that separation of them and they're all white men and the idea that um, eugenics presented that black people were not just inferior but more beast-like, it, you could say it's there. But I guess that the movie, when it talks about eugenics, doesn't go there. It's more of a visual and... Uh, all right, favorite part. I don't know if I really have a favorite part. Yeah, I can't really think of anything for this one. For the 77 version. So moving on. Uh, would you reread it? No, I'm good. No, you're good? No, I'm good. I'd rewatch. I, I don't know about the 77 version. I do. I'm, I'm the odd man out and kind of like the 96 version. I'll rewatch that one several times. I'll probably end up watching this with your kids at some point. Me, not necessarily for this, but maybe just in general, just so that way we can talk about it. But I mean, it's not a bad movie. It's not a bad book. Just nothing you'd care to explore again. Yeah. <laughs> it only gets a three. I might have to try reading this one. Like, actually, seriously, trying to read it. Difficult as that is for me sometimes. Um, so, this is an interesting one. Do we think it passed? Uh, honestly, I don't think so. I think they, because of the things they changed, they became two completely different things. <sighs> See, like, this is hard because we didn't actually explore the differences a whole lot. And our, we're almost at an hour and 15 minutes now. <laughs> By the time you cut this down, it'll probably be closer to an hour. But um, the fact that we were able to do that, a lot of the themes and everything stayed the same. And we only got into talking about the differences because of where I had to bring them up. Um, even with the changes, I don't think it's really that drastically different. I suppose. We were able to have a conversation. We were actually, if you consider the way H.G. Wells writes his books... We were able to talk about the things he wants us to talk about. I mean, about the only place we came up short was religion. And I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that. I'm just looking at it hindsight. Did we 2021. even talk about the actual horror aspect of it? The uncertainty of possibility being far worse than any definite fear? Uh, no, because you didn't bring it up. I just did right I, now. I, I drove the entire theme thing. <laughs> that was weird. Because we didn't talk about the horror aspect of it at all for this to be a horror, horror talk. Because it, it's there, the, the well, uncertainty of possibility. Because that's what scares Prendrick. Because that gibberish I just said there was a quote from him. Yeah. And the the uncertainty being worse than anything definite. Oh, yeah. Because uncertainty is always terrifying. No matter what the situation or topic. Um, but yeah, and, and, you know, one of Michael Crichton's favorite things, you know, science for the sake of science. Did I remind you of something? No, I read my note about oh. Moreau, how he's kind of like Sherlock. Elaborate a little bit more. Well, because Sherlock, um, he doesn't concern himself with anything but the science, everything else is material, eating, relationships, that kind of thing. Moreau has a similar mentality, the detachment from what he calls materialisms, passion, pain, all of that, 
everything's just a vehicle. Which is, I want to I touch back on this again then, um, with Moreau and his very rational mind, because he's actually, actually isn't, because he dismisses all the things that drive a, that, that give a person the ability to rationalize. Because we do a lot of very irrational things most of the time, and then to ourselves we'll find a way to justify it. So like for some people, the stimulus checks. Uh, a libertarian, that should seem like a, um, a contradictory or even further a hypocritical thing to accept that, right? Right. But a lot of libertarians will justify it, will rationalize it to themselves that I pay taxes, this is just my money coming back to me. I'm one of those people. <laughs> but there, there are a good number of them. And he goes, Jason Stapleton, like, he talks about this a lot, you know, that one way or another we'll try to rationalize the things that we do. Which is, Moreau does try to rationalize the things that he does. He does, and he, he just, he thinks he's kind of, he's above it. He, I think from his perspective, he feels he's evolved beyond it, and he separates himself from mm -hmm. other men, too, because he doesn't have the same needs that they do that he's risen above it he has but he's done this, this thing where i mentioned earlier church and then the state filling that um state f on an individual basis i think for a lot of people they might not realize it they will a lot of people will probably actually become vehemently enraged at being challenged by this who consider themselves atheists, but I think for a lot of people, when they remove religion from their life, they just fill that void with the state, and they become dogmatic about the state and zealous about the state. And I think that's similar with um, Sherlock or even Moreau, that they've given up these other things that they think they're above, but other things take their place. Well... I <laughs> He calls it pride, but he's also very passionate about his work, right? Right. So, I mean, he still has all those things. He just doesn't recognize it because it's not the traditional concept. And, like, Sherlock, you know, fills it with cocaine or doing cases or... Murder. Whatever, whatever it is that Sherlock Holmes does to fill those cracks in for himself because those are very human and some of them may even be very animalistic instincts um anyways all that being said uh there's a lot in there take your pick comment down below that's where conversation can happen not on twitter <laughs> <laughs> although if you're listening to a podcast it's kind of hard to do that maybe at some someday point we'll make a video version of this but till then I don't know. Tell me how wrong I am about the 96 version of the Highland of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. Do all those good things. Uh, share this with other people that you think might be interested in hearing some of these things. Overall, I think this is one of our better episodes talking about shit. <laughs> Whatever that was. Whatever that was. Toodles. <laughs>